At the same time, in the digital world, these ideas were also being explored. Uh, here's one example from 96 to 2003, JennyCam, which became part of the, the internet, the first, the, the web 1.0 revolution, if you like. JennyCam, perhaps the first internet celebrity, the girl that was uh, in college and utilized the internet as a way of putting herself through college. Some described it as the first reality TV show, um, but the essence of it was that we would tune in 24-7 to see what Jenny was doing. And, um, and that visual display of bodies, I think, again, was an interesting part of this web phenomenon. And that interplay of, of both being anonymous but also being very visible was, was central to what was taking place. So Jenny Cam attracted lots of criticism. Some people regarded it to be little more than an extension of what really was the biggest industry online, which was sex and pornography. Um, so for some people, this just seemed to be uh, another example of that. Others felt this was a, an example of, of female empowerment, that what Jenny was doing was stepping outside of a, a culture that is dominated by corporations and dominated by uh, ultimately exploitative ideas. Others said that she was simply a performance artist. As well, what's taking place was the creation of new journalistic practices online. So here's an example of, of one from Second Life, and you can see here the SL newspaper, within which you have articles about what's taking place within this second world. So we're potentially creating a, a new context for journalism to take place, where people are writing and reading articles about this new environment. So what did it mean that this was take, occurring? What did it mean to say that the internet was creating worlds in which people lived and um, had expectations of each other that were uh, quite dramatic, their lives being transformed around them. So around 2000, year 2000, uh, in, the, in, the sect in the area of biology, the Human Genome Project uh, announced its draft completion. And some of you will know that the, the publicly funded Human Genome Project splintered uh, a couple of years earlier and led to two factions, the public project and the project developed privately by Craig Venter, uh, in Solera Genomics. And that race, if you like, to complete arguably led to the, that uh, publication in 2001. But here we had again the, the dual narratives of optimism and anxiety. The idea that, in fact, this genome project might lead us down a route that we won't be able to come back from. So the idea of being able to genetically modify people, uh, particularly around the germline, suggested this prospect of, of playing God, suggesting this way in which we would redefine our role as, as, as people, as humans, as a species. And it was that pursuit that I think, again, caused a lot of anxieties and continues to cause a lot of anxieties. Um, anxieties that were reminiscent of the controversies around genetically modified foods. Would this be another case of Mons the Monsanto flavor saver tomatoes, which people were very anxious about and genetically modified foods generally created this culture of anxiety about around the science. So there was a strong sense that already by this point, by year 2000, that genetic revolution um, was failing us. It was failing as a, as a PR exercise. People were anxious about technology in a way that had no bearing with, uh, or no, no real justification in terms of where the science was going, but still this anxiety was, was apparent. It was accompanied by the other anxiety around this time, which, uh, of course, by the time we get to year 2000, uh, turned out to be a lot of fuss about nothing. But nevertheless, this sense of anxiety was heightened around the technology. We have a, a reporting the disasters, the imminent uh, falling, uh, airplanes falling out of the sky that would take place on the, on the striking of midnight of, of the year 2000. And this became, I think, part and parcel of that technological anxiety, which can't be attributed, of course, to the internet itself, but it's one significant dimension of computer culture that placed warning signals in people's minds. I think, again, the, the failure um, has been uh, as much about the, the, the means of communication about these technologies. And that's why, throughout the work that I've done, um, I've tried to engage with the media, tried to... Uh, put ideas out there in, a, in an attempt to, to articulate what's going on and to try to wade through the, the, the mud, if you like, of, of speculations that often confuses things. The Human Genome Project failed to do that. I think uh, the way in which digital culture became part and parcel of our lives limited that capacity uh, to articulate what was really at stake. 
Back to the Olympics, 2001, I was in Lausanne. Uh, the IOC, the Olympic Committee, had gone through lots of uh, reformations as a result of uh, a British journalist, Andrew Jennings, uh, alleging corruption and scandals, stories of IOC members uh, giving their votes to certain countries in exchange for scholarships for their children to high-profile universities. And they led, it led to this the creation of a ethics commission. Um, <coughs> so again, what influenced me here was the way in which ethics were, was becoming part of one of the major transnational organizations. How would this affect the way in which they do business? Are we beginning to see an era of more responsible practice? Or was this simply lip service? At the same time, the, human, uh, the World Transhumanist Association was formalized. This was a, this, going back to that guy earlier that is out of left field. The World Transhumanist Association began in 99, became very popularized, and its membership was around 4,000 by, by 2001. I became more closely involved with it by this time. In fact, I became someone that was seen as a transhumanist, whatever that meant. Uh, transhumanists were comprised of people that were academics, that were uh, scientists, that were science fiction fans, people that were enthusiastic about the promise of technology and less concerned by the peril, or the promise of peril, if you like. But at the same time, this terminology was becoming appropriated by, by uh, the neoconservative populations within the USA. So its predominant base was back in the USA. And uh, people were concerned that, in fact, this was some sort of radical group that was promising to transform humanity into ways that nobody wanted. The, at the time, the US President's Council on Bioethics, uh, led by Leon Cass, uh, very much a conservative, someone that didn't like the idea of taking technology outside of the most immediate human needs to alleviate suffering, for instance. And so anything that was seen to be an extension of that, the prospect of exploring life extension, the idea of creating human enhancements, making us better, as some would describe it, others would describe it as better than well, became a key political agenda within the US. This influenced significantly how people utilized that word transhumanism. And by 2001, we stopped using it. Um, the, the terminology changed. Our association with the WTA changed. And we set up something called the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which was a collection of academics, philosophers of technology, effectively, who, and bioethicists that wanted to pursue these questions with philosophical rigor and be informed by sociological work in this area. So we effectively separated ourselves, divorced ourselves from the community of transhumanists that were in meetings like this, putting their hands up and saying, well, that's all very well, but isn't the world run by robots? And believing that to be the case. You know, these, weren't just, these, these weren't just suggestions, they were convictions that people had. So this had to lead to our disassociation to some degree with this community. It's gone through a, a, a more... Uh, I guess, a more optimistic phase in the last few years, and it now calls itself H+, Humanity+. Plus. But this was, again, part of the context where discussions about the prospect of post-humanity were taking place. In the context of the binary, the idea of the technology again transforming us culturally, um, other things were beginning. And some of these things were really early, but still have yet to meet uh, a broader public. One example is uh, Dance Revolution, a, game that, uh, a computer game that began in 1998, but was, is still talked about as an example of, of how we can transform our expectations of digital uh, culture. So let me play you a clip, which if you've not seen... goes on to hit perfect every time. And what seemed interesting about this game was the idea that it could challenge our expectations and assumptions about computer culture, which was unhealthy, antisocial, and debilitating in terms of our, the intellectual content it required. The University of Chicago did a study of Dance Revolution and studied the communities of use around it. Computer games were becoming social experiences. 
where people had to work hard to take part.